Hallelujah. Praise God. So in Revelation chapter 3, you see a church steeple up here. You see verse 16 that says down at the bottom of the flyer, So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I use this scripture to say that, you know, we know John 3.16, but here's Revelation 3.16. This is the only place in scripture where the healer appears to get sick. He said, I'm, I'm going to throw you up. I'm gonna, it literally gives us an image of him ejecting, rejecting. Don't tell me a person can't serve God and then walk away and be reject and be lost. All right, so that's what Revelation 3 is talking about. And you know, beginning in the last part of August, we went until the hurricanes showed up. And then we, we went through all six of the churches out of the seven in Revelation 2 and 3. I, I'm not going to go back over that. But I preach what their names meant and preach what it meant today. And every one of them, it says, let him that has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. And it also said, likewise, to every one of the churches, he that overcomes. There was two that Jesus didn't really rebuke. The rest of them he did. And there's a lot to learn from that. Go back and you can glean from those. And we called them different things. We used a picture of a church in a dark background. But tonight when we reprove Halloween, I'm going to tell you why I call it that and not Halloween. I mentioned it just momentarily earlier. I'm calling it reproving Halloween in the lukewarm church. And the Holy Ghost told me weeks ago, he said, you're to preach about the seventh church, Laodicea, on Halloween night. October 31st, the seventh church. And this is the church dispensation, the age, right before John saw a door open in heaven and a voice that sounded like a trumpet coming out of heaven saying, come up hither, because all things are ready. Revelation 4.1, because 4 comes right after 3. Ain't that what y'all learned? So this is Revelation 3. And this is the last mention of how the church looked right before the rapture. In a lot of cases, sadly. Laodicean means the people ruling. Not God ruling. The people ruling. People making the call. The organization, the organized church making the call. Saying this is how it is. We don't care what the book says. We don't care what God says. We God now. This is how it's going to be. Somebody say the people ruling. Revelation 3, 17, say they were rich and had need of nothing. Somebody say they were the most prosperous church of any time. But sadly, all six of these churches in Asia Minor, they don't exist to this day. Because you can't revolt against God and last. But somebody say this was the richest church. They had more wealth than any other church. And Jesus told them in verses, you know, 16 here. He said, "I'm you lukewarm. Somebody say that means you're not cold, nor you're hot. Cold would mean just completely lost. Hot would mean on fire. Somebody say heat rises. Somebody say if you ain't on fire for God, you ain't going up in the rapture. Sparks fly upward. Amen. Job 5 and 8. Or Job 5 and 7. Somewhere it's written in Job. It's a job. Praise God. So let me move on. Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, lukewarm would mean that mediocre place. That place that's neutral. Shady. We'll find out that shadows and shady really bring us to the word darkness in Ephesians 5 in just a moment because it's up there on the screen as well and we'll get into that. Amen. Praise God. I'm going backwards, but it'll bring us forward. We'll get there. Amen. So the lukewarm church, somebody will say not cold, not hot. Just trying to be neutral. Trying to be friends with the world and friends with God. When James 4 and 4 says, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Nowhere in your Bible does God call the church to befriend the world. Hello? But the lukewarm church, her motive in everything she does is seeker friendly. Because she thinks that's bearing fruit. She thinks that's fruitful. But it's really just artificial fruit. It looks good on social media. They're the numbers religion. Everything they do is a count. They count down to the church starts, to the service starts. Stay tuned. Hallelujah. I'm saying that to somebody that's about ready to make it a man. Please let me know if I make you mad. I ain't feel like I preached if I ain't made at least one man. Hallelujah. They count about everything. They have to tell the church every service they have. They have to put it on the bulletin board. How much money? Stay tuned. 
Hallelujah. They got to announce everything they do to their social media followers. They don't obey Jesus in Matthew 6. They don't let their alms, that's their donations and their gifts to the needy. They don't let it be done in secret. They don't do like Jesus' command. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Because when your left hand don't know what your right hand's doing, I might as well put this down right now because it's going to be a drop the mic moment. When your left hand don't know what your right hand's doing, you don't get this. Huh? When you're helping somebody in need, you don't need to get all over social media and tell everybody what you're doing. You done got your reward. And that's when somebody else's left and right hand. Stay tuned. Hallelujah. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? These are scriptures, people. It's in the Bible. When you help somebody in need, you ain't supposed to go blast it all over the public and the street corners. We don't do it in the street corners no more. We just do it on the corner of our social media platforms. We got to make sure everybody got to know how many got this and how much we done this for and done that one for. And done. Oh, we got to let everybody know. And they get into the numbers, Rich. Stay tuned. I know I'm making somebody mad, get in line behind the devil or straighten your halo up on your horn. Hey, man, this ain't cocky and this ain't conceit. This is just confidence. This is the absolute naked truth. I, I ain't dressing it up. This is Halloween. A lot of folks is putting on masks, but I ain't putting one on the truth. Uh, anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Uh, uh, Lord, uh, God, uh, hey, letting people in the church uh, and they're saying we welcome sinners. Yeah, but you better warn sinners. Uh, amen. Uh, praise God. They're baptizing people in water in the name of Jesus. Uh, they they're still shacking up and living with each other. They still homosexual. They still lesbians. Come on, somebody. They still go to the honky tonks on Saturday. Oh, glory to God. But they dunking them in the water because it looks good to have two or three more numbers added to my social media report. So I look at us growing. Somebody says artificial fruit. That ain't real growth. Anybody here, Holy Spirit? You know, Noah wouldn't be too popular in our culture. He preached 120 years and didn't, and didn't win but seven people, and he was the eighth one on the ark. His numbers wanted to look too good. Modern, compromising, lukewarm Christianity, not Christianity. Come on, somebody. It is a numbers religion. Everything's about how many you got coming, how many came, how many we come. And that's what we identify success. Let me tell you what success is. Preaching the truth no matter who, no matter what. Preaching the truth uncompromised in season and out of season. Second Timothy 4.1. Preaching truth whether you get that or that or not. Come on, anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Because one day, let me tell you, where the balance of success eternally is going be measured. God's going to say preacher, hold out your right hand. Hold out your left hand. Let me see if there's blood of any man, or woman, boy or girl soul on your hand. Did you not tell them what I said? Or because you wanted them to come back, you held back. Oh, glory to God. Mm. Y'all, I'm trying to get there, but I am. Somebody say the lukewarm church. I'm about to show you the Halloween we got now. Even the name of it. It all comes from a lukewarm stance against the darkness. Against this cultic movement. Instead of just calling it out and standing against it. Like the scripture says to do, reprove. Instead, they tried to bring in an alternative alongside of it. So, in their defense, they would say to combat it. But it weren't combat, it was compromise. Somebody would say, you don't come alongside of darkness and borrow, borrow some of the things they do and just redress it, rename it, Christianize it. And somehow God winks at it and says, okay, this is fruitful. Look at Ephesians 5.10. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Who cares what anybody thinks, including me or you? It ain't about what I think. Hello? What does God say is acceptable? 
If you're a true believer and you're a follower of Christ, I'm talking about one of them radical ones. That don't just believe but wants to believe. That's what you live for. What does God accept? So the opposite of that would mean what God rejects. Listen to what he tells Paul right here in Ephesians 5.11. He said, and have no fellowship. Now we started off with 1 Corinthians 10.20. Have no fellowship with demons, with devils. And it ain't just Satanists in a seance or witches in their coven. Come on somebody doing their incantations and calling on spirits, you know, and all this stuff that people just make light of and watch on the TV like it's just a little fun and fake and phony. When you do that, spirits are in your room right then. I mean, it don't matter if it's phony or make-believe. Witchcraft sin. Amen. 1 uh, Samuel 15.23. So he said, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Some I'll say, but rather um, reprove them. Some ought to say the works of darkness are unfruitful. Period. It don't matter if you redress it, rename it. Fellowship literally means association in any way. Some ought to say no association. Brother Marvin, why don't y'all have something during this time to present to kids? I do. It's called preaching. Dylan's in the bank and he's telling them some of the same things right now. My kids grew up and they never trick or treated and they weren't depleted for it. Hello? I didn't call them to preach and I didn't anoint them. And I didn't tell them follow me and mama or else. Didn't have to. We think somehow if you tell kids they can't do something that God says not to do that we're going to harm them somehow. Hello? And let me tell you, these things are connected to a root of witchcraft. And where there's witchcraft, there's rebellion. We're living in a generation that is pure in their own eyes, but not washed, cleansed from their own filthiness. Proverbs 11, verse 30. They think they're okay, but they're not. They can rebel against the preacher because they can rebel against their daddy. They can rebel against their mama. They can rebel against their grandparents. So it makes it a whole lot easier because a lot of them heard their parents rebel against the preacher. Rebel against God. Practice and Christianize witchcraft. They leave the church service and all they do in the cab of their car is talk against what the preacher was just preaching. And their kids is listening. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? And they're speaking against God and they don't even realize they're speaking against God because He is His Word. Somebody say it's unfruitful works of darkness. Well, Brother Marvin, we're doing this as evangelism outreach. No, you're not. If you are presenting any so-called outreach with anything that is compromising and condoning with the darkness I'm about to expose to you, you are deceived. Stay tuned. Because the world is deceived, but she's not deceived worse as the lukewarm church is. Because the lukewarm church, in the name of fun, the outreach of fun, you know? and so they bring alongside of these dark practices, they bring along and they Christianize it, redress it up, and rename it, and they just call it an alternative. Why don't y'all do that, Brother Marvin? You about to know why. And I started preaching this. Because God started teaching me this in October of 1991 when I got saved. 34 years. I started hearing these things. And I'll go ahead and tell you then, for the most part, now, I still don't hear it being preached. I've had preachers look me in the face. More pastors than I can count. Look me in the face. And say, Brother Marvin, I know what you preach about. This is the truth. I have studied it for myself. But if I preached that in the pulpits of our church and I didn't let them do it, I wouldn't have nowhere to preach. I said, brother, I'd be preaching on the street. I'd be planting my own church then. Hello? Years ago, I was in a revival and I'm talking about God was moving. I ain't going to say to the denomination. It was during the same time of the year. Mom, you remember, you was there at that revival. There was over 200 people in that place and the altar was filled up. I'd been there for more than a week. There was people walking in and off the street drunk, getting saved and becoming sober. God was delivered. They was teenagers all in the altar that got filled with the Holy Ghost. They was in the altar that night. God was moving. You remember? I started preaching on this. And it got to the altar call point. And you could feel the stiff neck and the spirit in the house, but that ain't never stopped me. I expect that. 
But to my surprise is I'm at the altar with a microphone on my hand and God and, and teenagers crying and God's a moving. The pastor takes another microphone and shuts me down. And takes the service over. And his first thing he said, I'm taking my pulpit back. When he said that, the Holy Ghost said, I'll take it from him in a few weeks. How can you say that? Because that's what a prophet will do. It ain't all this personal little feel-good stuff. I walked to the pulpit in that stage. The height of that stage would have been like the top of this pulpit. That's how high, I mean, and the width of it, you could have put about five of these up there. And I walked up to that stage and I put the microphone down. And I ain't told this too many times publicly. And I don't care who sees it and hears it. It's the absolute truth. I put the mic down and I turned my back to the altar. And I laid my hands down on that platform and I began to weep. Not because the service was stopped, but because what God told me. Because it happened just a few weeks later. God took that church from him. God did. It's his. He can do that, you know. That ain't my pulpit. Thine is the kingdom. The power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Matthew 6. 30. This ain't Marvin's church. So woe unto you when you speak against it. It's ain't Marvin's church. I've done been destroyed by now. If I told you some stories and some stuff, I, I wouldn't even be around. I'm telling you. This ain't Marvin's. I ain't got that much sense. I ain't got that much wisdom. He said, I'm taking this service back and taking my pulpit back. And I grieve because I heard the Holy Ghost said, because he said, I'm going to take it from him and show him it's mine. And give it to another. And God did that a few weeks later. I was crying up there. And when I walked off that stage to go change, I was weeping so hard. Did you ever say anything? No, I didn't. God told me not to say that. But God did exactly what he said. And it was over this message. And what's so sad about this message is, yeah, the world's going to fight at you. Expect it. They're supposed to. They're of the world. They're still walking as children of darkness. But what disturbs me the most is those who claim to be the children of light. Ephesians 5 talks about And they will defend the darkness as child's play, as fun, and as an outreach when it says it's unfruitful. I didn't put it up there. So the word fellowship, we've got to break this down. And I'm not going to go into some of the things that I detailed in, you know, last year and different other times and just outline because I would go through Deuteronomy 18 and tell you every little practice. and where I, You can go back and Google those things. I just want to stick with this as far as preaching it to the church. Somebody to say, prove what's acceptable to the Lord. So if he's your Lord, you want to know what he accepts. What he would Have no fellowship. Somebody to say, that's a command. Fellowship. What's the word fellowship? Fellowship, what does that really uh, show to us? It means to communicate. It means to share company with. And here's the best definition of the word fellowship here in Greek. Co-participation. A cohabitation. A co-participation. I can't get the co and the... Yeah. Hallelujah. And so God says to do this... Is where we find the word as we interject the word alternative. So remember this. You've got to remember this as I get into some things in a moment. Some ought to say to have fellowship with means to share company with. To have a co-participation. An alternative. Something on the side. Not all the way that. But just enough of it. And then enough of Jesus around it. To make it seem like it's now okay. Some ought to say it's no longer light. It's no longer dark. It's gray. It's lukewarm. Let me tell you, you compromise with Halloween, no wonder you ain't got no power to cast demons out when people stand in your altars. You cannot compromise with darkness and cast demons out. If you don't call them out, you won't cast them out. I've had people approach me through the years, Brother Martin, teach us how to cast out demons. What's some gold nuggets? My first one at the top of the list, casting out devils 101. You got to preach. Mark 139, Jesus preached in their synagogues. Notice it weren't just, Jesus cast devils out everywhere, but the majority of demons he cast out was in the temples. Cast a devil out. He preached. Somebody say, if you compromise, you don't preach. You ain't casting devils. And you can't compromise with even this. You think you're going to have power over darkness. 
So fellowship, some ought to say a co-participation. Remember that. That's where we get the alternative word from. Unfruitful means barren, empty, darkness. This is where we get the word shadiness from, a shadow, a shade. Not completely dark, but a shade of dark, gray, mixed with the light. Some ought to say lukewarmness. Some ought to say it's empty, it's barren, it's unfruitful. So all these people that says we're doing this as an outreach, you're not. It is not an outreach. It is unfruitful. It's deceptive. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? So don't be tricked. Let's know the truth. So let's understand what God is saying here. I want to teach you about when Halloween began. As far as the name. The name Halloween. The earliest celebrations of what we call Halloween. It weren't called that then. It began among the Celts back over in you know Europe 2,000 years ago. And places like England, Ireland, and Scotland, and Wales, and Germany, and France. This is the history of the unholy, the unhallowed roots of Halloween that we have today. This is where all derived from. Somebody say from darkness and that that's demonic. And uh, these were intellectual people. You know, they were known far as druids in the religious form of it. And uh, they were religious priests. They were all religious, religious judges, lawmakers, and scientists. Kind of sounds like America, don't it? Today, everybody's religious. Hello, somebody. Everybody, everybody believes. Everybody likes to talk about faith. I don't mean it's faith in Jesus. I don't mean it's faith in God. Ceremonial, religious. Hello. They could say they were Christian, but they were demon worshippers on the side. Kind of like Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab would try to go worship Jehovah, but then he had to worship Baal along with his wife Jezebel, that witch. Amen. So they were double-minded, double-hearted, double-toned. Amen. And they worshipped, and this was some of their worship. They, they had an elaborate, it was very elaborate, elaborate satanic religious festival. Somebody say they called it a festival. This is the root of all your terms that's got festival in it. Festive. Fun. That's the whole narrative of it. It's okay, Brother Marvin, because it's fun. Sin has pleasure for a season. Hebrews 11 and 25. So does sin because you're having fun doing it okay? All in the name of fun. One to us when we make the spirit of fear something fun. Think about it. Well, I don't go to your church, Brother Martin. Y'all speak in times, get loud and shout, but yet you'll go to a haunted house and pay somebody to make you scared. I'll tell you what a haunted house means in just a moment too. This one's a holy haunted one. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Bible says in Nahum chapter 3 and verses 4, 150 years after old brother Jonah got spit back out for rebelling God out of the whale's belly, he was ready to go preach then. He went to Nineveh and they repented, mama. He preached and they repented. And then he got mad because they repented. Boys, preachers, I tell you. 150 years later, Nahum the prophet goes to the same city, Nineveh, and they revolt and rebel against his message of repentance and they wouldn't. And God had to judge them. Why? Because he says through the mistress of witchcraft, which selleth or deceives the nations through her sorceries. Think about it. In Nahum 3 verse 5. Somebody say the mistress of witchcrafts. Who deceives the nations through her sorceries. They had been bewitched politically and religiously. And they fought God. And would not repent. Some I'll say, because it was now accepted. Who selleth the nations, deceives. And when you look at that word selleth in Nahum 3, it literally means that that apparently becomes acceptable. It's acceptable now, Brother Marvin. When you start accepting what God rejects, that is compromise, that is nothing other than lukewarmness. Why you think I got up under church over here reproving Halloween and the lukewarm church? Look over there. There's the only spook you're going to get tonight. Luke the spook. Lukewarmness. That's a spook that needs to be cast out of the modern church. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Boy, I can tell you some stories from the Bible that will spook you out. You want to talk about a real hell? Last, last year we preached on a real hell. And I, like I say, i got to stick with where I'm supposed to be going tonight. Hallelujah. But, but ain't this amazing? They have their little elaborate pagan festival. And that's where the term festival started being used. All the way back. This was in the year 
This was in the 7th century, people, 14 centuries ago, where all this is derived from. And the celebration was called the Vigil of Samhain. Samhain, now that's in honor of their god. They had, they had many gods. One of them was called Samhain, and they called him the Lord of the Dead because when they worshipped him, it was a celebration of death. They would actually offer human sacrifices. They would take human fat, cut and put inside, make a candle out of it, human flesh now, of somebody they just killed. And they'd make a candle out of it and cut up turnips and put demon faces, cut them out, carve them out on turnips and put the human flesh burning as a candle inside to ward off evil spirits as they worship Sam Hain, Lord of the Dead. The year 900 and beyond, it kind of become the pumpkin. I guess they had more room to work with. Hello? And the modern jack o lantern I'll get into that in a moment. They had another god they worshipped too because they didn't just worship one. They had one they called Muckola. I called it Uckola. Amen. And Muckola was the Celts' sun god. So during this time of the year, in the later part of October, as it's getting November, the days are getting shorter. And so Muckola, their sun god's losing power. And Samhain, their god, he's a wicked god. He's the one that comes to kill. That's none other than Lucifer, that's Satan himself. Because he's a murderer from the beginning. Amen, John 8 and 44. And they, they didn't call him Satan. They just called him Samhain. But amen. The, the days are getting longer. And you know, and, uh, or excuse me, the nights are, are getting longer. And the days are getting shorter. So darkness seems to be over the earth more than light is. And, and so they had this tradition. Somebody say this tradition. During their festivals, they would light great bonfires. We call them bonfires. We don't put an E on there. We just stop at bon. Fire. And that ain't wrong that you call it a bonfire, but that's where it came from. Bonfire. Why bonfire? Because they were throwing people into the fire as a sacrifice to Sam Hain. To appease his wrath from bringing some evil trick with his evil spirits on them. And so their tradition was human sacrifice. Taking human fat, putting it inside of turnips, lighting it on fire, setting it outside their houses to prevent evil tricks from evil spirits. So when people dress up their kids in costumes, I don't care if they had a trunk or tree parking lot of a church dressed up like Moses and Jesus. Dressed up like Wonder Woman and Spider-Man it makes no difference. When they walk up to the trunk, and I'll go ahead and tell you, most of these trunk of treats, a lot of them, you're going to see jack-o'-lanterns at them. You're going you're gonna to see some of the, the same imagery. But it just gets Christianized. It ain't no different. You know what they're representing? They're representing demons coming to play evil tricks. And to keep the evil tricks from the evil spirits, they present a trick to them. And this is where this custom's derived. So you can dress it up. You can rename it. You can call it hallelujah parties. You can call it the trunk or treat. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. You can call it all these other names and rename them. And, and you know, and, and, and it, you can call a demon by another name. It's still a demon. You can dress people up like biblical characters. But if that's what they're getting treated with, it is still derived from the root. And my friend, you can change the surface. You can call it something different. But the root is still pagan. So here we go. And I can't never get through this quick, so hold on. During this time of year... Sam Green, Sam Green, Sam Hain grew stronger, they believed. No, we don't believe this, but they did. And it was a doctrine of demons. Demons taught them this. Well, Brother Martin, we don't believe that. I don't care. Demons taught it. This is doctrines of demons. I don't play with it. Have no fellowship with it. Have no cohabitation, participation. Don't come alongside of it, even with an alternative. Somebody say that's lukewarmness, that's compromise. And so they would carve demon faces on those turnips and scare off evil spirits. So kids dressed up in whatever are representing from ancient paganism an evil spirit. I don't care if they're dressed up like Moses and John, Jesus, whoever. It don't matter if it's in a church parking lot. I went to a church years ago during this time. It was back in the late 90s. I ain't been there since. 
Somebody had enough nerve to invite me over to preach. I used to get invitations, people, during this time of the year in the, in the middle, late 90s, early 90s, in the early 2000s. I'd get invitations. I'd have to turn people down wanting me to come preach on this in the Pentecostal churches. Literally, I'd get invitations. No, I don't get invitations no more. I don't hardly give invitations to nowhere. Amen. Hallelujah. But I am not slacking up. I, so I went in this church and I walked in and said, Oh Lord, I better just get a good glimpse because I won't be back here. I know. They had jack o' lanterns lit up in every window of the sanctuary. I said, Lord, what was that guy thinking when he got permission for me to come preach here tonight? Oh Lord. I probably would now, but I didn't then. I went right through there while I was preaching and grabbed them. <laughs> I have grabbed cocks off the walls while I've been preaching. Y'all, some of y'all been in them revivals, didn't you? And they'd send, they'd send district overseers and send people in high positions to check me out. What's he doing? What's he doing? What's he? Is he okay? And I remember one was sent where I was preaching one time, and I went to the pastor afterwards. I said, brother, I'm going to go ahead and go out. I said, we'll go eat tomorrow night. He said, why? He said, I, I said, no. I said, because I know he's been sent to talk to you about me. He said, what? I said, yeah. He called me up the next day. He didn't tell me all the cops. He said, brother, Marm, he was dead on. I said, I know it was. Holy God, when I saw him walk in, God told me why. He said, but you don't understand. He said, when you was preaching about prayer and being away from God, he said, the first thing he said out of his mouth before he started speaking what he was sitting there for, do you think he was preaching at me? I said, Pastor, I wasn't preaching. The shoe fits, take it off. You're on the holy grounds. All right. yeah. Hallelujah. But I knew the Lord told me that's why I could. I had a pastor one night tell me, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, uh, I need you to go in there and apologize to those people tomorrow night. I said, I will not. I said, I'll pack my bags right now and I'll go somewhere else. I said, but I will not apologize for obeying the Holy Ghost. I went and grabbed This is back in the day. This is in the middle 90s. This is when all the phones was hanging on the wall. Or on the counter and had long cords on them. I grabbed the phone and I walked it over to him. Had one of them long curly. And it just reached halfway across the house, pulled this, this you know thing off of the this picture off the shelf. <laughs> I went and grabbed the phone. I got a meeting table. I put my chicken leg down. Went over and grabbed the phone. I, I, I went and I crossed the table. I handed it to him. I said, "Here, I'll dial. I'll dial the number for you. If you want to report on me, I said, but you will not get me to go in there and apologize tomorrow night. I'll go home. I'll leave tonight." I said, it's two hours home, I'll go. But I will not go to that pulpit that's five miles down the road tomorrow and apologize. He said, no, we ain't going to do that. I, ain't gonna... I said, well, I ain't going in there and apologize. The next night we had that place so packed, there was churches from everywhere else heard that what I did and rebuked something. And, amen. And they all had to come and check it out. And people was getting saved in order that night. Amen. Half the church left that night, but it got filled up the next night. And you know who was in line at my cassette? This is how long ago, people. We were selling cassette tapes, albums. You know, we'd have the whole album folder. You'd pull it out and it had all the messages from the revival. He was. He said, I want two of them. The pastor was the first one in line to buy. I told him, I said, you better get your eyes off of them old haughty things that's in here and thinks it's their church and got mad last night and walked out. I said, you better get your focus back on them ten young people in the altar that got filled with the Holy Ghost when all them people walked out. I said, you more worried about them because you think they're paying the bills of the church. I said, the church belongs to God. Ain't you got church of God on the outside sign? I said, it's supposed to be God's. I said, you better get your focus on the word. This ain't your church. Hey, man, don't you compromise with them because you know they're going to be mad at you tomorrow. Hallelujah. Didn't you want revival then you want to see God move yeah. hallelujah and I had to eat a cold chicken leg that night hallelujah I'm not making these things up hallelujah thank you Lord but they would think by building these bonfires and throwing humans they'd come to some doors and, and, and get virgin girls and sacrifice them I mean it was horrible and uh, people say, well, Brother Marvin, that ain't what we're doing. I know it's not what you're doing, and I know it's not what you believe, but it still does not disconnect it from what it is. So Halloween got its name in the 7th century from the Christian church. Some might say the lukewarm Christian church. Don't you know if there was a lukewarm church back in Asia Minor? They's always been one around, and they're still around. Luke the spook controls the services. Luke the spook controls the preacher. Ain't about to preach something. 
make anybody mad. Because preaching is just getting a check. You're going to get a check in eternity. I'm going to check you off. The 7th century Christian church, they set aside. I can, I can preach this. I can. In the month of May, so don't, don't waste your times wearing your thumbs out, texting me and attacking me. I don't care for you. I ain't responding to people's thumbs because I'm already thumb body in Jesus. So don't waste your time. Hey, praise God, wearing your thumb out, trying to attack me and fight with me. I had somebody from a Christian college years ago trying to attack me on this, and before I got through, they shut up. Hallelujah. I thought, Lord have mercy, some educated guy in a seminary in some high big Christian college wanting to fight me over this stuff. I said, man, go out and contend for the faith. Go preach some real stuff. Doesn't you hear you trying to preach against me preaching on it? Lord have mercy. Anyhow, so in the month of May, 7th century church, said you know these celtic people these these this is wicked customs this is anti-christ anti the cross and we got to do something to combat it instead of just preaching against it and standing against it they said here's what we'll do we'll make us a ceremony similar and we'll call it th their day you know they do this at the end of october on the 31st so november the first We'll have an All Saints Day. They used to do it in May. They first started to do it in the month of May. They said, but we've got to get it closer to the actual date. So let's do it the day after. And to combat their wicked festival of Samhain, here's what we'll do. We'll call the evening before All Hallows Day, November the 1st, on October the 31st, we'll call it All Hallows Eve. That's where it's derived to and come from. Now we call it Halloween. All Hallow. Hallow. Hallowed be thy name. That's a word Jesus used when praying in Matthew 6 and verses 9. Somebody say, hallowed be thy name. It means holy. So they called it the eve before all saints day, all hallows, all holy day, where they paid respect to those saints that had been martyrs for preaching the gospel because it was a lot more then, and, or somebody that died for the preaching of the gospel, and they would celebrate these saints. And then they kind of transferred and came over to praying to dead saints. So you see how it all led them. And we've got people that do that today. They think if you pray to Mary and Jesus. No, you pray like Mary prayed to Jesus. Anything else is necromancing. It's talking with the dead. Deuteronomy 18, 12 talks about it. I ain't going to go there. But he meant praise God. So we don't, we don't pray to the dead. I had a witch one time tell me, said, well, y'all Christians, y'all pray to the dead. I said, no, you ain't read the rest of the story, dear lady. I said, Luke 24, the Bible said, he's not here, but he is risen. I said, the God I talked to, they crucified him. But three days later, he come out of the grave and he now ever lives. Seated at the right hand of God. The Father make an intercession, Hebrews 7 24. I told a witch that. I sit in underground Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia, for hours watching this woman. She was so busy down there. People's come and sit at her table. She had uh, earrings with stars on them dangling down here and had stuff painted all over her face. And people would sit down and with one hand hand her a bunch of money and then they'd hold empty hands out and she was reading her palms and looking in the teacup with the tea leaves, pouring them out on the table and with her tarot cards. And I sit there, I prayed in the spirit an hour and a half. I said, God, when are you going to let me go to it? And I just kept praying. Fine. Finally, she got a small break, a small window came afforded to me by the Spirit of the Lord, and there weren't nobody there, and I walked up to her, and I said, ma'am, I said, I, I'm a preacher of the gospel. She said, oh, sir, would you? I said, no, I ain't come sit down. To I said, I just want to let you know Jesus loves you, and I quoted a couple of scriptures, you know, about the gospel of the cross, and oh, thank you, dear sir, I'm a believer too. And she was saying, and then I started quoting to her, like Revelation 21 and 8, those that practice what she's doing, sorcery, are going to spend eternity in a lake of fire, and, and I began to warn her out of love. Of, uh, for God and all of a sudden I saw her eyes change I realized we weren't talking just a woman I realized there was a demon in her her eyes changed her countenance sounded like two or three men talking her face began to contort and twist and an anger a demonic hatred come all over her face and she started making a loud scene and here come a policeman with his baton on his side amen and with a pistol on the other side <laughs> 
And uh, he was coming to her rescue, he thought. And I let him know. I was backing away. I said, dear sir, it's okay. I said, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I said, I was just sharing Jesus with this woman and warning her about her practices. I said, but I'm moving on. I said, uh, I'm not disturbing, you know, the the peace only the confusion i'm just hallelujah praise god I, I moved on oh she liked it when i told her jesus loved her i like she liked it when i told her about the cross and how he died for her but as soon as i begin to tell her about the same jesus that died for her warns her about what she's doing could send her to a lake of fire she got mad and the demons in her rose up hallelujah oh glory Oh, glory. <laughs> so all these things we're speaking about are also seen in the modern customs. Now it's a pumpkin. And you can, you can cut a smiley face on the pumpkin. It's still a demon. That's a demonic glee. You, you can write scriptures on the pumpkin. Christianize it all you want. Now cut it open. Fix it, make a pie out of it, and bring it to me. Some will tear it up. I'm not saying you can't eat pumpkins. That's a waste of a pumpkin. It don't matter if it's a smiley face or if it's a demon's face. It's still a demon. And it's a smiling demon. You don't believe demons smile and laugh? You ain't watched TV lately, especially in the political circles. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Them demons will laugh at you, laugh, smile, and laugh. People hanging ghosts, sheets, putting ketchup on them. Spiders, they spooky. It ain't not just this time of year, they spooky all the time. People got pet tarantulas, don't bring it around me. Be a smash tarantula. Hey, Lord. Amen. Witches. Skeletons, a fascination with fear, death, and the grave. How in the world is that to, to be something to be calling fun? People will laugh. They have been so des desensitized so long watching the garbage of a man on TV and on their phones. They watch people die all the time and they think nothing of death. Every time I hear about a death or even see one presented on TV, even in something that my God, I can think about, Lord, is somebody leaving this world going to hell? Think about it. And people are desensitized about dying in death because it's glorified. At this moment. Somewhere tonight there's witches and I promise you there's not there's some and they ain't too far from here. And I promise you if they around they know I'm here. I used to have them follow me. Hello? I heard of a testimony of a witch that switched. <laughs> it was real high up in witchcraft. I watched this years ago on a documentation and very high in witchcraft. He said, you know, a lot of people don't believe in us. And, and, and they make light. He said, the Christian church makes light of October 31st. And, they, and he, was even, he was teaching stuff I was teaching and I couldn't believe it. I said, here it is. A converted witch is saying what I'm preaching. And he was talking about the reality of it and how important this day was. And he said, I can remember getting paid to put curses on people. And it happened to them. Yeah. He even killed people. He even talked about leaving his body and going to other places. He was that high up in his, you know, commitment to Satan. But Jesus conquered that devil. And he, was t he said, but I can remember getting payments to try to curse certain, he said it was a few, certain Christians or a preacher or somebody. He said, when I would get in the spirit realm, when I would start doing my thing, and I tried to put something on them, he said, on several occasions, that person, when I'd see them, like in the spirit, when he was, he said, when I'd, he said, there would be a flame, like right in the center of them burning. And he'd say, oh no, I can't curse that one. That one sold out to Jesus. That one's full of the Holy Ghost. That one is really surrendered to Christ. I can't, I, this won't work on them. 
Say, could I try to do it and it would come back? I couldn't, I couldn't, it wouldn't work on them. Somebody shout, even the demon possessed and those that practice these dark things, they know, glory to God, better than anybody else knows whether that person is the real deal or not. When they start dealing in this, I used to have them follow me and they would, you know, take church signs and paint pentagrams on them. Remember that mom and I do street meetings, they'd follow me around. Some people didn't want even me coming to that church because they knew if I came to the church, the witches and the Satanists was going to mess up the church sign. Went to one church and they come and raided and messed up all the air conditions. Hallelujah. Amen. When you study the Bible, look at the men of God in the Bible. Wherever they preach, there was witches coming. Oh, they'd get saved. Somebody shouting, they'd take all their books, all their witchcraft teachings and books in imagery. Amen. And Paul would have them throw it in the fire in Acts chapter 19 and miracles would happen. When you study that, amen, when they burnt those books that night, somebody shout, it's equivalent to today's terms and, and money. It would have been about $50 million worth of books of witchcraft. Somebody say you don't go to a garage sale or a yard sale and sell witchcraft. You throw it in the fire. A couple of years ago we had a service like this and we burnt stuff back there in the fire. People brought stuff. All the little witchcraft movies and all the little witchcraft emblems. And I ain't going to get into all that tonight. That's not another time I could start naming stuff. And I've went to houses, it's been a long time, but I remember used to get calls and I'd go to houses because houses would be demon-possessed. Not just people. I had a family call me one time and said, Brother Marvin, we got a beautiful house we just bought and everything, but after we bought it, we found out somebody was murdered in here, and now it makes sense. We keep hearing screamings and horrific sounds and stuff going on. And Lord, I speak your blood right now. This is only in the Holy Spirit I speak this. And they said, what can we do about this? Will you come pray? I said, yeah, I'll be there. Walked in there, and I, when I went to that certain particular part of the house, man, you could feel a coldness. I don't know how to explain it to you. I went to praying and rebuking that stuff and quoting the scriptures. I went through that whole house. They had oil spots. I don't know if they ever got them cleaned off because I took the oil. Slung the oil. Hey, man, that boy had oil leak. Well, I was praying in the Holy Ghost and rebuking stuff. I talked with them weeks and even months later. No more. We don't hear none of that no more. I said, that ain't dead people. That's familiar spirits. That's demons that was in a part of that act. They're hanging around. That's why when I go into a motel room, I don't care how pretty it is, how nice. Amen. If it's real bad, I rebuke roaches first. But, amen. But I go, <laughs> I go into motels. I said, Lord, I don't know what was done in here, what was watched, what was said and done in here before I sleep here. But I ain't laying. I only, you, you, my kids is what me. I, my wife's what me. I don't even hardly get my bags down long enough for Oh, I'm praying and speaking the blood of Jesus, binding up everything in there. Amen. Hallelujah. Brother Warren, you crazy. Mm -hmm. Who's fool of you? Hallelujah. I remember I got called one time by the, uh, the state overseer and district overseer to go to this church. They was going to try me out to pastor. And so I had to preach a Sunday morning and a Sunday night. And so it was a pretty good long distance. So they opened up the parsonage. Real nice parsonage. Beautiful house. And boy, if you was real easily deceived by this and Stuff, you'd have just said, oh, yeah, this is where I'm supposed to be. Not in the Holy Ghost. God told me that night when I got there. He said, I ain't sending you here to pastor this church. God told me while I was laying in the bed, I sent you here to cast demons out the parsonage. When did you hear that? Lord, I speak the blood of Jesus. This is only in the Spirit. When you laying in the bed... Dylan and Brianna was there. They was too young to know anything. But when you're laying in the nice king-size bed, beautiful room, beautiful house, you lay in there and all of a sudden you hear something walking through the house. And all of y'all is in the bed. Lord, speak your blood. This is only in the spirit. When you hear literally cabinet doors in the dark going, and everybody's in the bed. You can even be scared out your mind. But you can get up and scare that devil out of that place. In Jesus' name. That thing come on my wife. She couldn't even talk. She was, it was like it was choking her. She couldn't even speak. After I got through praying for her and the devil come off her, I went back to the light switch. God told me, he said, you run devils out with the lights off. You don't be scared. I cut that light switch off. Let me turn it back on because that's the one outside. And I went through that house. I knew I had my bottle of oil. 
Hallelujah. I went through every part of the house, and this was a rural church. It was out in the woods, kind of like where I live, so y'all don't think nothing bad at me for doing what I did next. Because I didn't take time to dress. I had on my Fruit of the Looms and my cowboy boots and my T-shirt. Please shut down the theater of your mind. Shut it off right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. I was in the spirit, but there was a whole lot of flesh showing I, hey, I walked outside that part of the sun. I was slinging oil. I was having an oil leak again. Hey, man, you ever been behind somebody? Everything was messed up, man. He just slinging oil out till Papa. Yeah, I was, I was a praying. And I got back in that house. I soaked down and sweat. There was oil spots in the house. I saw the oil spots the next day. I didn't really know something until the next day. I said, oh, Lord, I hope they don't send me a bill. <laughs> yeah, there was oil spots everywhere. But I promise you, when I went and laid back down, they wouldn't know that stuff here no more. And the Lord told me, he said, every pastor that comes here, demons run them off from this church. Now go preach this and preach that tomorrow morning and tomorrow night. And when the district overseer comes in here and everybody wants to vote you in, you tell them you can't. Don't tell them why I sent you. <laughs> and they did. Some even was crying wanting me to pastor. And I had to tell them no. I was in my early 30s, middle, middle 30s, somewhere in there. And God said, whatever you do, don't tell them. Well, I said, yeah. And I left that church that night praying for the next pastor to come in. Because God told me, he said, every time I see him, one of mine here, this, this, this house is demon possessed. These demons have set up camp here. He said, run them out. I sent you here that night. God sent me to a church one night. Hey, Amen. And I dreamed about it the night before. And I ain't never been to that church. I walk in. I was like, ooh. Let me turn the way it looks. It's still like one of these shotgun churches like ours. Ooh. I look and I said, my God, I've never been here, but I've been here last night in the dream. And in the dream, God had showed me a demon sitting up in the choir loft in the left side as you face in the pulpit. He said, this demon sent here to steal the word and he, he attacks the pastor every time the pastor tries to preach and he can't preach. I'm standing at the back of the church, pastor's coming to greet me with some other brothers. And at first I'm in a daze and I'm, I'm feeling for their hand to shake because I'm, I'm tripping out because I just dream. I ain't never been here, but I dreamed about it the night before. And it worked long. Man, he called me up. They didn't sing long, didn't do much. He called me up. I said, Lord, I, ain't never, I know I ain't never been in this church. Most of them back then, son, they'd sing an hour. And uh, I come up to the pulpit, and I'm looking the whole time like this. I approach the pulpit this way, put my stuff, and this is back in the day with, you know, tie, three-piece suit, cufflinks, thick hair, slick back, still do a lot of that sometimes. Had more hair though. But, uh, and I said, uh, great to be here, but I'll be right with y'all in just a minute. And I took the, <laughs> the turd just like this. And I walked up in that choir loft and I said, you foul spirit. And I went to calling that thing out and I went to quote Second Thessalonians 3 3. I can remember it like it was yesterday and I was in my late 20s. Amen. I said, the word of God will have free course here tonight and be glorified. You won't stop it. And when I turned around, Brother Danny, I didn't sing. I preached for an hour and a half with a gust of a hundred and on fire and weren't looking for a water hose. Oh, glory. I soaked down and I preached and boy, the altar got filled up. But right before folks went to come into the altar and God went to moving, I had one word of knowledge that night as the altar service began. I said, God told me and I knew who it was. I just would see if they're going to obey. If they wouldn't, I'd go to them and tell. I said, there's somebody here when you try to open your mouth and obey what God told you to say and do you get to choking and coughing and, and I ain't even talking with that pastor that pastor comes walking from the front he leaves where his wife's sitting and he's crying hey man and as I walk toward him I didn't even get my hand on his head the power of God hit him hey man and it's like somebody picked him up and he didn't land there he landed out here unharmed and the power of God come on him he went to speaking in tongues man that altar filled up hey man and the pastor told me hey man and he actually told everybody when he come to the pulpit he said for six months and they all knew it he said every time I try to go to preaching I get to coughing and I just have to stop and the doctors told me ain't nothing wrong with you he said what happened to me until I preached I was invited to come back there one time more I came back that night he preached for over an hour from the opening of the service you know like I do something <laughs> he <laughs> Pastor Dennis said Sunday when he preached, he said, man, they was liberty and free. I said, everybody says that. And everybody can't think nobody preach what they come here thought they was going to preach. Hey, man, he, he, he preached.
preached, I promise you, well over an hour, and I didn't care if I got to preach. I just sit there and smiled and glorified God. Amen. A church that's pastor ain't been able to preach in six months. My God, he could have preached on, and he still called me up there, and I preached over now. But that's how Pentecostal churches had churches back then. I remember having revivals. We'd, there'd be folks who laid out inside and outside, and it was after midnight, and it was a work day. Yeah. You used to get invited to come preach on Wednesday nights. Revival would break out. Well, now we just reduced it to a class and a teaching. And a few cookies and a drink. Hello? Oh, glory. Oh, boy. Oh, my. When is he getting through? Soon as I quit. Somebody's thinking, brother, it's going to be All Saints Day in just a few minutes. No, there's still three hours before All Saints Day. we still got three more hours in October 31st right now. Amen. <laughs> so, All Hallows' Eve. Christianity was spreading back then in the 7th century. But this pagan religion of the Druids also continued in its popularity. So, while All Hallows' Eve, where we get our modern word Halloween, originally had been a so-called quote-unquote Christian holiday the pagan influences from the earlier traditions their festivals of the Lord of the Dead Samhain begin to slither and ease its way and creep its way alongside of and right up in the lukewarm church then and the influence oh, begin to grow in its popularity and it gives us what we got today and then as the years progressed, we see it now. The customs, the practices, North America alone. The observance of Halloween, it's a big money maker, people. It's second to Christmas. As far as making money. Selling candy. And it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Costumes. Second again only to Christmas. But is it hallowed? Think about it. We've got to ask this. The glorification of the spirit of fear, evil, the occult, fascination with death and horror. You know, the young and the young at heart this time, they just do it. All. It's just fun, Brother Marvin. It ain't those ancient things. We don't celebrate those ancient customs. Somebody say you cannot call it something different and make it different than what it is. You can rename it, redress it, do whatever you want to. But God says have no fellowship with it. And he said reprove it, Ephesians 5.11. Somebody say that don't mean approve it. Because this is about what God approves and disapproves. Reprove. The word reprove literally means to confute. Some ought to say to overwhelm the error. Some ought to say overwhelm the error. When people's having these fits against me when I preach this and they're just they get overwhelmed, they get so insulted. And that's what it's supposed to do. So thank you. Your complaint's a compliment. Thank you. It means to refute it. Somebody say to refute it. That means to prove that it's wrong and false according to God's truth. God says you ain't to fellowship with it. Somebody say co-participate with it. Come alongside of it. Cohabitate with it. Give your alternative. Amen. Rename it. Redress it. Call it something else. Christianize it. And still participate because that's what the fellowship No, You're supposed to reprove it. Another word for reprove it is rebuke it. Somebody say call it out. Call it what it is. Now, I'm not going to go into Deuteronomy 18 and give you the long list, but verses 9, when God brought his people out of bondage in Egypt, the Egyptian worship of these false deities and gods had a lot of this in it. Even some of your uh, modern so-called Easter stuff um, that you see today, because Jesus has never been Easter. He never will be. He's never had nothing to do with it. He's the Passover. He's the Pasha that was sacrificed for us, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And so the goose laying eggs and the hare rabbits and, you know, and all the egg hunting stuff, even, even, even some of that's derived from the Celts too, a little bit, and also the Egyptians and stuff. So when Jesus brought his people out of Egypt, he required Egypt to get out of his people. And so he told them not to learn to do after the abominations of these nations, their customs. Deuteronomy 18 and 9. The word learn after means to imitate or mimic. Some ought to say don't learn to do what they did. Uh, uh, that means don't even imitate it. Some ought to say don't imitate it. So therefore in God's eyes, some ought to say which is the Bible. 
somebody actually practicing these customs in full belief, like those ancient Celts did, or these Egyptians did, or someone merely just imitating and dabbling with them in the name of fun, somebody say they're both forbidden by God. Pretending like or imitating an, an evil spirit or dressing up like one to receive a treat is not suitable for those who are born again. Amen. Neither is dressing up like a Bible character to receive a treat. I'm getting in all it. Rename it, recall it, re-identify it, say what it is, still a demon. Trick or treat in any form is an imitation of these ancient pagan practices. You know, again, call the devil another name he's still a devil amen it just christianized and it's an imitation of these ancient evil things and the practices in deuteronomy 9 kind of or 18 give, after verses 9 give those lists and i'm not going to get into all that and so likewise watching horror films attending horror houses telling gory ghost evil spirit somebody say ghost because here's what a ghost is if it ain't the holy ghost it's either the representation of somebody dead their spirit, or either it's a representation of a fallen spirit, a demon. There's only one Holy Ghost. And uh, Job 7 and 10 said, when a man dies, his spirit don't come back to his house. The Bible calls them familiar spirits. God says you're not to look to those who have evil spirits that peep and mutter, but you're to look to the law of God, the word of God that's written. Because anybody speaks not according to God's word, amen, it's not the light, it's darkness. That's according to Isaiah 8, verses 19 and 20. Somebody say a familiar spirit. A familiar spirit will impersonate the dead. Now, I'm not telling you you don't need to go to the graveyard and, you know, you sit by the graveyard morning and, and part of the grieving process which you never really get over. Amen. You just, you know, I'm not telling people it's wrong to go there and, and to talk with their loved ones or talk like that. I'm not, I'm not against that. But when you start praying to them, Deuteronomy 18, one of the things he said not to imitate is necromancing. You remember the 1985, you that's old enough, the uh, Whoopi Goldberg, she's got her own problems now, but uh, she had them then too, but uh, just worse now. But uh, and, and then you had Patrick Swayze, uh, he's deceased uh, in that one, you know, the movie Ghost. You know, and he got killed and somehow she's the medium, the witch, the one, the mediator between the dead and the living. And she's talking, look, that is witchcraft, people. People are not talking to dead people. They're talking to demons, familiar spirits. Familiar spirits can impersonate the Holy Spirit. They can act like the Holy Spirit. They can even present themselves as the Holy Spirit, but it's not scriptural. Oh, they're spiritual, but they're not scriptural. Anybody hear Holy Ghost? And it can present itself even as the Holy Spirit. That's why you need to know the Bible. That's why we preach so much about doctrine around here. Why do you think Jesus cast out demons? Because he preached doctrine. Read it in Luke 4, 32 through 36. He was preaching doctrine. A lot of people are shallowed over a little surface, shallow, superficial word and a personal prophecy. Amen. But they cannot endure sound doctrine. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 3. Why? Because it's teaching. They don't want to hear teaching. They don't want to be taught nothing. I just want to be the one that caught something, not be taught something. Amen. And so they can't be taught. They just want to be caught. They want to get, get, get to feel good. Get, you can be feeling good and not following God. Anybody hear the Holy Spirit? So a familiar spirit, amen, could impersonate the dead. I had a man one time. I sat on his front porch. He said, Brother Marvin, the reason I called you over here, he said, you know about my wife. You know, she's been deceased for a while. I said, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm, I don't remember when that happened. And, uh, and I said, I prayed for you. He said, yeah, I appreciate that. And he said, the reason I called you over here, he said, because you're not the first preacher I've called here. He said, you're about the third or the fourth one. He said, I couldn't get no honest answer from these men of God. He said, I believe you're men of God. I just didn't know. He said, so I figured I'd call you because you deal with what I've heard about you. I said, okay, let's, what is it? He said, um, something keeps showing up in my house, in a certain place in my house, uh, near the restroom in the hallway, every night at a certain time. I said, really, what is it? He said, it's my wife. Or coo -coo 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 -coo. Don't don't just imagine people's going cuckoo. Sometimes this thing's legit. So Lord, I speak your blood and we in the spirit. And I said, look, and I started teaching about familiar spirits. I said, now is your wife? She was a believer. He said, he said, oh yes, she believed in God. And uh, I said, well, sir, I'm just going to tell you the honest truth. He said, I knew you would. I had somebody text me the other day. They was just early in the in the faith. And they just got saved first part of October somewhere now, and then they text me and said, Brother Mom, what about Halloween? Is that acceptable? I believe I, I said, I've heard about you. I'm going to ask you. I knew you'd tell me the truth. So I sent them a copy of last year's. So they said, I knew you'd tell me the truth. I said, yeah. So he said, I knew you'd tell me. I said, Brother, that ain't your wife. I said, your wife's in heaven with Jesus. 
I said, that is not your wife walking in the house. I said, I said, when you see her, you scared, ain't you? He said, every time. I said, your wife scare you when she was alive? He said, no. I said, that ain't your wife. I said, that's a demon impersonating your dead wife. Trying to scare the life out of you. And uh, he said, what should I do? I said, rebuke it. In Jesus' name. I said, matter of faith, you got any oil in your kitchen? We'll do it now. I did. I saw him a few weeks later. I said, you see her anymore? He said, no. I said, don't look for her again. That wasn't her to begin with. That's a devil. God said, when a man's spirit leaves his body, he don't return to his house. Job 7 and 10. Well, Brother Marvin, 1 Samuel 28 says that Saul, King Saul, in his backslidden condition, God wouldn't speak to him no more. God wouldn't speak to him through the prophets no more. God stopped talking to him in judgment, so he went to the witch of Endor. Uh, and he disguised himself, and he got her to, with a familiar spirit to call up Samuel from the dead. And he came up. Someone to say, uh, familiar spirit means to speak from the ground. The ground's what we've been made from, so it's to speak from the flesh, from your own imagination. A lot of people's calling that prophecy and a move of God in these hours we live, but they're just speaking from their flesh. They're speaking from the ground because it's always about what somebody wants to hear. The flesh, the flesh from the ground. Somebody, it's a familiar spirit to speak from the ground. And she said she conjured him up. God don't conjure nobody up. Now, he'll raise folk up. But he don't conjure nobody. And she brought him. Amen. And here it is. This ain't Samuel. This is a familiar spirit. The Bible calls it Samuel because, listen, it's that's what they said it was. So the, the witch of Endor, she said, oh, you're Saul. Because Saul had done made a command that you couldn't practice witchcraft or you'd be killed. And, oh, you've deceived me. And he said, well, what do you see? He said, I'm not going to hurt you. What do you see? She said, I see an old man with a cover over his head. She didn't ever see that it was Samuel or not. They just called it Samuel. Somebody say it just looked a little bit like Samuel. His face was never seen or never heard. And then the so-called Samuel, the prophet, that somehow God, who was against using familiar spirits or even speaking to the dead, now God's broke his own command and going to let a witch call his prophet back from heaven. He saw it come out of the ground. God, let me, let me tell you, there ain't no saint in the ground. They up there, they up above in heaven. And then that thing tells Saul, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be with me and your sons because his sons had already died. That thing didn't come from heaven. It pretended to be Samuel. How you know? Because God says not to go to witches. And he refuses those who practice with these familiar spirits. So God didn't somehow wink against his own command not to use witchcraft. And then God somehow, amen, belowered himself to use witchcraft to get Saul's attention. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? And Saul's sons weren't where Samuel was to begin with. So that thing that said it was Samuel was not Samuel. Amen. Praise God because Saul's sons was not where the prophet of God was. Oh, in a body hear the Holy Ghost. Somebody shout, people are not talking to the dead. They're talking to demons. When you pray to a dead saint, you're praying to demons. You should pray to the living Savior. Oh, hallelujah. So, let's continue. Thought he was about through. I am. I'm closer to the end than I was. Horror houses. Haunted houses. Literally the word horror or haunted means unholy houses. There's some churches that's corpses that's that. Friend, all this stuff I'm showing you that's become acceptable as alternatives that people just in the name of fun and rename it and re shade it up and what, redress it and call it. It came in the 7th century church, the Christian church. Even the name Halloween was a Christian name. The lukewarm church is the one that started all this. That got all this so confused up. It's all mixed up now. That's where it come from. That's still where it's rooted at. In lukewarmness. So a horror house defined as a place listed as frequented by a ghost of the deceased possessed by evil spirits. In other words, associated with it is fear, hell, darkness, evil, 
demons, Satan, witches, torment, anguish, death, murder, curse, jinxed, eerie, and spooky. Everywhere you've looked today, everybody's advertising whatever they're trying to sell got spooky in it. Spooky, spooky, spooky. Why the modern Luke the Spook Church, lukewarm church, ain't nothing wrong with this, Brother Marvin. It's an outreach. It is unfruitful. I don't care if you got apples and they're floating in the tub of water. That's even a connection with some of the witchcraft um, uh, traditions that they did with, with, with uh, you know, magic and, you know, a belief in who you were going to meet after you bob for an apple or, you know, you know whatever. Praise God. And I ain't going to get into all that tonight. Amen. But somebody say, if the Holy Ghost dwells in you, all this just makes perfect sense. I was a few weeks old in the Lord, October 1991. Me and my mama on Halloween, while it was daylight, Drove up to a store, and I was watching kids. I'm so sick in my body. I was watching kids get out and go in dressed up as demons and ghosts and witches and Satan. And the store was giving them candy. And I remember as I was sitting there while Mama was in the store watching that, I started weeping and crying. I said, Lord, I don't know what it is. Something ain't right about that. Because prior to that, all my teenage years, this time of the year, I'd work in haunted houses. I played Freddy the Kruger so many times. I had the mask. I had the razor gloves you wore to hand. They, of course, it was plastic. And I had the fake chainsaw. Or a chainsaw without a chain. That was still stupid, though. You was breathing in all that stuff inside of it. I don't mean to say Scaring people that, you know, people paying in the schools and everywhere. I mean, we it, we got big into it. I'd, I'd, I'd hang sheets in the trees with pillows on them and put that fake blood up. Boy, I was all in. I watched them horror films. Boy, I watched them all. I was obsessed with all that stuff. Yeah, I was obsessed with all that stuff. Three weeks after I got saved, it was Halloween. I'm weeping. Saying something right about that. Show me, Lord. Oh, have mercy, did he show me. Hallelujah. Remember one night I got a call. I said, Brother Marvin, our daughter's having wicked dreams and scared to death. Seeing dead people and stuff. I said, I'll meet you there in a few minutes. But when we go in a room, I said, get you the biggest trash bag you got. I said, why? I said, make sure ain't nothing in it. I said, why? I said, because there's probably many items in that room. Well, I walked in there. I found troll dolls, which means a demon that work on earth. I started throwing troll dolls away. Little, little, little troll doll. I mean, it was yin yang signs. I mean, you know, Taoism, Chinese witchcraft. There's balance. There's no wrong. There's no right. It's all just good energy. Just nothing. Put us there. Oh, you throw? Yeah, throw that away. There was that upside down cross with the broken arms. It's called a raven's foot in in in, in witchcraft and witch covens. And uh, but we know it as the peace sign. It has nothing to do with peace. It's the cross of Nero, an ancient emperor who hated Christians in Christ and killed them and burned them at the stake and let limes eat them. And that was his emblem. Amen. Which meant with the circle around it, I'm gonna stomp out Christianity. And he turns the cross upside down and breaks the arms on it. And we call it peace sign. Boy, went to throwing them in there. Throwing them in there. I was walking through there and I started looking through their movies. Back then it was the VHS. They boy, they had all these Disney movies with witches in it and casting a spell. I went throwing that stuff. I said, what are you doing? I said, you can't keep this in here. I said, I can pray these devils out and they'll leave, but as soon as I leave, they'll be back. I said, because you got items that are connected to their darkness. Hello? Oh, Lord, he has lost his mind. I sure did. And I found the mind of God. I went rebuking that stuff after we got it all cleaned out. There was necklaces. There was movies. There was, there was music. There was all kinds of stuff. Man, that big old, they brought in one of them big old, you know, yard bags. You know, you put your leaves in that thing. That thing was half full of stuff. Clothes. There was clothes in there. He said, what you want us to do with this? I said, go take it to the trash pile and throw gas on it and set it on fire. Like Acts 19 says to do. I said, if you're really serious, go set it on fire. 
When I got saved, that's what the Holy Ghost told me to do. I took all the music I had. Amen. Even the, the, the tapes with me playing drums on it with the band I had. I went out and threw it in the trash heap. Amen. And I lit it on the fire. Somebody say, ye the tears or you not. You can't play around with that stuff. And I threw it away. And I burned it. Like Acts 19 says to do. Oh, bro, that's just too extreme. No, no, no. When you embrace in this stuff, you live in the extreme. Hallelujah. And it's grieving the Holy Spirit. Alternatives, somebody say, without the preached truth of God, only breeds deeper deception. No wonder many modern churches ain't got no power to cast a devil out. They've been fellowshipping with demons with their participation and their imitations associated with their alternatives to Halloween. Oh, anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Somebody say you cannot compromise with darkness and win souls, but you can sure produce false converts with compromise. It ain't no outreach. Your Bible and mine, if you're reading from the one I'm reading from, His Word, Ephesians 5.11 says it's unfruitful works of darkness any fellowship with it somebody say any association with it in any lighter form it is still considered that that god disapproves everybody say as you're standing to your feet a devil called by another name is still a devil reproving halloween that's why i don't call it holy in the lukewarm church. Somebody say Luke the Spook. Because I just proved to you that the orientations of all these customs, even though they've been renamed and called other things, is where the name Halloween was derived from. It was derived from not a combat, but a compromise with this darkness. And so they started doing things alongside of it. The eve before All Hallows Day, November the 1st, All Saints Day, was called Hallow's Eve. Now modernly we got Halloween and somebody say that's supposed to be a Christian. How many of you ever associated with Christianity? Don't matter if people do or not, they're doing it every time they compromise and do the stuff they do. But rather we're not trick or treating that way. We're doing our it don't matter. It don't matter. It does not matter. You still presenting those pumpkins with faces? I don't care if they're smiley faces. Demon face, it don't make no difference. It was an alternative, and that's where, why we got what we got now. The deception that has been the breed from this compromise. Some ought to say it starts in the lukewarm church, and it's seeker-friendly churches turning into corpses. Come on, somebody. In lukewarm pulpits. It caused this to continue like it does in the hour we live. I have had pastors, I'll say it again, they've looked at me and said, I know what you're preaching is the truth. But I can't preach it here. It's like, woe unto me if I don't preach it. That devil almost had me compromise this year. said, nobody don't want to hear that. I had pre people trying to tell me in 2020, it's the wrong time of the year to be talking about that because of the pandemic. I said, I'll preach it in season and out of season. In the middle of your plot demic or whatever. Because there's an epidemic of error. I ain't preaching this to the world. They ain't going to watch it anyhow. Unless there's a few that might say, I want to see. But the ones that get mad the worst. Ain't that amazing? People that's doing these things for real, they'll get mad at you, but they know you're saying the truth. But alongside of them that's getting mad at you is the people that say they're the children of light. God said in Matthew 6, 21, if your light that's in you is really darkness, well then how great is your darkness? What's worse, people in the dark who fighting you over preaching against the dark? Or people who claim to say they live in the light and they fighting you over the darkness, wanting the darkness to become acceptable. Amen. They've got used to the dark like the old hymn, the song I call the hymn of the McCamish from back in the 90s. Getting used to the dark. Getting used to the dark. That's the modern church world. 
You don't believe me? She ain't getting used to the dark. Her sanctuaries are getting darker. Y'all, I can't do it. I played my drum semi-professionally. I made a living doing it. I met a few famous people doing it. And I, everywhere I went, I, we were somewhere not long ago, me and my wife, and I looked at her. I said, look around in here. She said, what? It weren't even a church event, it, but it was in a church. I said, you see all these black seats? I said, every one of them honky-tonks from the smallest to the biggest ones. And we played in some nice ones, too. I said, every one of them, the ceilings was blacked out. I said, look at the thousands of dollars of lights. I said, it reminds me of them places I used to play in. You know, it was dark. Dark. So dark. I said, I will never do that. Because Acts 20 verses 8 says, there was many lights in that upper chamber. Somebody to say the Pentecost church had many lights. I didn't write the book, it's right there. If you got to have a flashlight to make it to your seat at the church you go to, you ought to find you somewhere else. Who has told us we got to make the fog move? I'd rather see the glory come. Who in the world says we got to turn down all the lights and we got to. I've watched people walk in with the flashlight on their phone, especially the older folks. And I don't know about y'all, I ain't the 51, I'm closer to 52, but I got to have more light than I used to. Lynn said, My God, turn the light off, Brother Marvin. I said, Sister Lynn, I am not a bat. I don't operate off a of sonar. Hallelujah. I got to see. I mean, see, like the older I get, the more light I got to see. Just to, to be able to see, rather. Amen. Brother Marvin, you're saying, cause we try. Yeah, you getting worldly. You getting used to the dark. I know how to fill a church up in a, in a week or two. How? Give everybody what they want. Don't tell them nothing they got to let go of. Let them, ha let them have it their way. Let them have what they want. Just prophesy good things to them. Let them do whatever and then be the shepherd that follows sheep and just, just enjoy walking in sheep doo doo. Cause that's all a shepherd does if he follows sheep is walk in sheep dung. But I'm not a dung sheep walker. Come on somebody. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Give me an old path. If I can't grow it with preaching, I don't want it. And if I can't grow it with a move of the Holy Ghost Speaking in tongues from another world And just saying it like God said it would then so be it Call me Noah And me and my seven will make it When the judgment pours out Oh, anybody hear the Holy Ghost God, I give you praise We're going to play that song by Mercy Me So Facebook can probably throw us off there Ghost. There's a ghost inside of me. Start it over if you will, because I know how that not like those dreams and internet's like some church folks There's sits a off. Ghost inside of me. Not like those dreams in old bed sheets. Seeing trick or treat. Different. Come on, you've heard a real ghost story tonight. Oh, this ghost is different. Come on, let's gather around his fire tonight. Not one that leaves me scared to death. God ain't gave us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Second Timothy 1 7. So guess who gives that? Satan does. Oh, holiness keep on. Whatever the fear is you're dealing with tonight, God said, I'm going to deliver people from fear. Oh, by the spirit of faith. You are my hope, you are my peace. Ironic in a way, I'm no longer afraid. Yeah. And the ghost is to blame. The Holy Ghost. Turn it on up up here for me. Holy Ghost, yes. There's a ghost. There's a ghost. There's a ghost inside of me. Not something from some campfire story where I'm terrified to sleep. Come on, won't you just welcome the Holy Ghost to touch your life tonight? Opposite. This ghost is quite the opposite. It's quite the opposite. He came just like a welcome friend. You're a welcome friend. I was comforted. Let's 
keep haunting me And the ghost gives to play. Holy Ghost. We pray for your holy haunting in the church. In these last days, Lord. Haunt us with holiness. Lead me out of the darkness. Pray that. Lead me out of no holy. That's what he'll do. He'll lead you out of the darkness. Lead me out of the darkness. Lead me out of your known. Oh, lead me. Holy Ghost. Oh, you got on both sides. Hallelujah. Lead me out of the darkness. Lead me through the unknown. Oh, Lead me, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Lead me through the darkness. Lead me through the unknown. Oh, lead me, Holy Ghost. Lead me out of the darkness. Lead me through the unknown. There's a ghost. There's, There's a ghost inside of me. Holy Ghost. Not like those dreams in old days. Lord, let us encounter your person and power tonight. We receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come on you. Acts 1 and 8. Lord, that's my prayer on this night where many are embracing the dark ghost. Not one that leaves me scared. We embrace the ghost of this light. The ghost of your word, the Holy One. Fill them, Lord. Woo! Yes! Woo! Hallelujah! Oh, fill a God with your Holy Ghost. You are my peace. I run away. Lord, fill Papa Joe with your precious Holy Ghost. Come, come, Holy Ghost. Let your fire, let your power come on him, Lord, mightily tonight. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Whoa. God, I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Where I'm terrified. Holy Ghost. Feel my mama fresh, Lord. Touch. Woo. Yes, he's different, ain't he, Papa Joe? Holy. Use him, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Holiness. Lift your hands, brother Rick. Weren't too long ago you said, Lord, I ain't felt you like that in a long time. You won't be able to say that after tonight. Touch! Lord, let your fire lie in Jesus' name. I'm no longer afraid. Yeah, I'm no longer. And the ghost is he did it again, didn't he, Sister Ruth? I'm not afraid. <laughs> I mean, the Lord telling you, darling, don't worry about her. I got it took her up. Remember that? <laughs> yeah! Hallelujah! How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost, and with power that he went about doing all manner of good healing. All that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Acts 10 38. Yes, no. Holy me. Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. Touch Sister Jesus. Let your Holy Ghost come tonight. Lord said, come stand right out here. Lift both your hands. Lord, touch her. Now the Lord said, lay both your hands right here. God, Lord, do that miracle.
miracle in me is a fire. Yes. Oh, me, me, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Lord, break down every wall and every partition, everything between what it is you've said would be and that that is in the present that forces itself against her faith. Yeah. Let your Holy Ghost come tonight. Tear that down. Break that down in the name. In the name of Jesus. And grant her the victory, Lord. Come, Holy Ghost. The Spirit of the Lord shall come upon you. And you'll be turned, changed into another person. Woo. First Samuel. Different. Different. Oh, this ghost is different. Not one that leaves me scared to death, but puts my fears to rest. You put my fears to rest. David said, "What time I'm afraid I'll put my trust in you." Psalms 56, 3. You ain't got to tell me what it is, but there's something that's been tormenting you in fear. You are my Raise your hands if that's you. My peace. Yeah. Somebody say, God ain't gave me that spirit. So God gave me just the opposite. Love, power, and of a sound mind. Hello? Sick of David one said. Somebody say, so if God didn't give it, I don't receive it. What time I'm afraid. It ain't wrong to be afraid, but God said, what time I am, I trust in the Lord. Psalms 56, 3. Jesus. You ever heard those no spiritual superheroes, so to speak? Make it sound like if you fear something that somehow you ain't got faith. Doubt proves to me that I got faith in God. When I doubt God's word, if I'm struggling with doubt, that's proof I really believe. Because how could doubt bother anything but my faith? He came just like a welcome. So if I'm fearing something, that means I already got faith. He gave every man the measure of faith, Romans 12, 3. Somebody say, I really believe that's why I'm fearing. How can fear attack anything but faith? Oh, somebody say, you just got to make your decision which one you're going to follow. The faith of the fear in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Touch them, Lord. I speak your blood over these young kids, Lord. Speak your blood over everybody in here. No longer afraid. Yeah. Come home, Holy Ghost. Quicken this mortal body by your spirit that dwells in a Romans 8 letter. spirit of faith he is, 2 Corinthians 4 13, and he's about to overpower that spirit of intimidation and manipulation that tries to throw its web on you. Oh, it cast you over into a corner and hurdle you into a ditch spiritually. Oh, the Lord says I'm giving you power over that tonight. Oh, yes! In the name of Jesus, lead me out of the darkness, lead me through the unknown. Sing it one more time. Lead me out of the darkness. Lead me through the unknown. Oh, lead me. Holy Ghost. Lead me. Lead me through the darkness. Lead me through the unknown. You can leave it off. God, do you be the glory. You be the praise in our King Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we commit our spirits into your hand. For you have redeemed us, O Lord God of truth. Psalms 31 5. We lift up our soul unto you who dwells in the heavens. Psalms 25 and 1. We present our bodies unto you as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. Unto God, which is our reasonable service, Romans 12, 1. The Lord, somebody lacks confidence tonight because, like all of us, we have failed you at some point. There ain't one in here that ain't never failed you many times. But many times, Lord, you forgive and 
restored and raised back up. Lord, if it's the past, it's the past. And our sins and iniquities, you said you'll remember no more. Hebrews 10, 17. Somebody, your fear is rooted in condemnation over what you've done. Ask God many times to forgive you about, but you still struggle. And you're afraid to obey God because somehow you believe you're not even worthy to. And within your own merit, like the rest of us, nobody's worthy of themselves. But somebody say, by the blood of Jesus, we are worthy. Somebody say, by the blood of Jesus, we are worthy to do what he said to do. And be not afraid to do it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Holy, holy. If you're struggling with fear and it's connected to that, and you say, man, that is me. That is identifying with me. God says, get out of your seat. Whether if you've been up here or not, stand before my altar. God told the church at Sardis, which would have been the fourth church, in Revelation 3 and 4, he said, There has a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And they ain't but one thing that makes the garment white. I'm talking about in the spirit. Revelation 7 and 14 said they washed their robes while the snow and the blood of the Lamb. So with those two scriptures combined, somebody say the blood of Jesus says I'm worthy to walk with God. It's right there. Then in verse 5 of Revelation 3, he said, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Don't tell me he don't blot people's name out. The word blot don't mean a race. That's what he did to our sins. Blot means to draw a line through the name. In other words, when they stand before God, you're still going to see their name, but there's a line drawn through it. That's people's backslid. They, they lost. They ain't going to make it. But just because you fall down don't mean you've got to fall away. And it don't matter who don't forgive you. If Jesus forgave you, by the blood that makes you white as snow in his sight, walk with God. Because by the blood of Jesus, somebody say, I'm worthy to walk on with God. Even after I fail God, when I ask him to forgive me. So somebody say, walk on, you're worthy by the blood. In Jesus' name, here he comes. By the blood, you're worthy to walk with God. Whew. No longer frustrated. Ah, yes! In Jesus' name, what is clean is clean. Psalms 147 said he covers our head to the day of battle. And I declare the images and the nightmares and the foulness that torments your mind to loose you now forever and never touch your mind again. Woo. In Jesus' name, you foul spirit, you'll not touch her in her sleep, in her dreams, in her thoughts, no more like that. In Jesus' name. Somebody say, by the blood of Jesus, we are worthy to walk with God. Hallelujah. Anybody want to praise God, testify, give God glory? Somebody want to say, thank God, we know he's through. <laughs> Some of you is about to say amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody's thinking, well, we won't be here to midnight, but some of you, distance you got to drive, it'll be almost midnight when we get home. Every time I leave here and it's night time, it's usually around almost midnight when me and my family get home. Because we're around here even after church doing stuff. So, because uh, I'm, I'm, I can't, Lynn said, how you know? Because I can't get away from me. I <laughs> like some people can. <laughs> I'm stuck with me. <laughs> They said, get beside yourself. I still ain't figured that one out. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Able to be at church one more night. Here's where mama just celebrated 
the number 79. 79 years. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. What an honor. I see Dylan's watching. Dylan, we about through. Y'all know there's a time delay. So I'm about to quit. So if you start now, you'll be right on time. <laughs> Amen. Speaking of Dylan, uh, uh, Maddie's uh, mother and father, I'll just call you father because you raised her. Amen. Praise God. And uh, Brother Mark and Sister Amy, they're here all the way from Wisconsin. Amen. And uh, Samuel's grandparents. Praise God on Maddie's side, and I know they've been enjoying him. How in the world couldn't you enjoy him? Praise God, Hallelujah! And uh, so glad to have him them here tonight. Uh, when are y'all going back? Sunday, Sunday afternoon. Uh, okay, you gonna be here Sunday morning? Oh, uh, okay. I was gonna see if you wanted to sing. I was gonna put you on the spot, but yeah, I know. Yeah, so at when? Time changes Saturday, so you, you you fall back. Yeah, one more hour you fall back. Sister Melissa's falling back all the time, right? Amen. Praise God. Amen. So, uh, yeah, Sunday morning we have a very, of course, God's word's important period, but I have a uh, very important message to preach, and. Uh, this is, is the Sunday before, you know, the 5th of November. And uh, unlike scaredy cats in pulpits, I ain't scared to preach. And I am going to preach what God says and what he sees. Because the Bible is very clear. According to Hosea 8, and I'll be coming from there, you can elect kings, leaders that Govern you and yours that are not of him. Amen. So, just a little nugget. I'm going to preach again the difference between light and dark. Because that's pretty much like it is. It's like night and day. Amen. Praise God. So, God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. And uh, God's best and God's blessings on you as you travel back home. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Yep. The you sing You sing that? Yeah, yeah, Silent Night, ain't it? That's why. <laughs> Who knows? He might sing. I don't know. I'm just cutting up. Yeah, Lynn gonna sing with it. Loretta Lynn gonna sing. <laughs>